I now have great pleasure in introducing to you um, our second international speaker, Dr. Jeff Young. Um, Jeff flew in after um, two and a half hours, two, two and a half days of travel and uh, hopped in a car and had a two hour drive up to Gatton to talk to the university students up there about his passion, uh, which is dissexing and particularly early age dissexing. And um, he's a very warm and passionate person and we're absolutely delighted to have him here. So would you please welcome Jeff. Well, good morning, um, and thanks for having me here. Um, Richard's kind of a, I took it from his talk, that he's kind of a glass half full kind of guy, and I consider myself kind of a glass half empty kind of guy. <laughs> you know, having said that, um, having said that, I coach distance running. I've coached rugby, played rugby for 16 years, um, and I'm a firm believer your only obligation in life is to try. You know, the question is, are we trying and with a purpose in mind? Uh, are we making a difference? And I think those are things you have to ask yourself every day. I worked animal control. I went to vet school and worked animal control, and it changed my view of the world and how we treat our pets. It was phenomenal to me. And I understand Dr. Hurley was the same way, which is kind of interesting that we've come to so many of the same conclusions. She's in shelter medicine. I'm a private practitioner. Assume for a minute that I am in it for the money. It's okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with making money, quite frankly. Uh, everybody knows the five freedoms, and you know, this is great, and I, I believe in all this, but this is the half empty kind of side of me is, okay, from the age of 15 to 44, for females in, in the world, the number one cause of death and disability is men. Okay? That's not a very positive thing. One, one third of the population of the world are basically in a starvation state. One third are underfed. And one third, we're probably it, are probably overfed. Okay? Uh, 15 million children starve to death, children starve to death every year. That's a glass half empty to me. Now, do I believe we should still be doing what we do in the humane field? Absolutely. There's an 80-some percent correlation between animal abuse and child abuse. People who beat their wives beat their dogs and vice versa. There's no mass murder who didn't start out murdering dogs and cats and other things. So um, it's all interrelated, you know, and it all has to do with, as far as I'm concerned, evolution uh, for us as a species. I'm talking basically about spay-neuter, prepubertal spay-neuter. What's the ideal age? Um, I know there was some questions about, because I put on there for, you know, if you're a humane society, nothing should leave your place without being fixed. Period, end of discussion. I just think in this day and age, if you're sending out an animal intact, you're doing something wrong. Having said that, they do it all over the United States. They do spay-neuter contracts and things like that, and they don't work. They absolutely don't work. As a private practitioner, this is the money part of me, I would rather see you several times, give you vaccines, give you wormy medication, talk to you about flea and tick control, all these nice things, and make money as I go along, and then spay and neuter your animal at 16 or 20 weeks when you're getting your last set of shots. And that's perfectly logical, okay? They're still not gonna breed, okay? But the humane society part of me, and I work with a lot of humane groups, you know, if they can, in, Col in Colorado, you're not supposed to adopt before eight, eight weeks of age. Having said that, if I had a dollar for every time someone told me it was eight weeks and it was clearly more like four or five weeks, you know, I mean, people fudge on ages or they don't know ages. I will, I will spay and neuter anything. I've done them 24 hours old. If they have a heartbeat, I will fix them. I have no problem with that. That's my only consideration. They have to have a heartbeat. It's not very successful otherwise. Um, so as young as 24 hours, um, prepubital spay and neuter, uh, Bob Christensen wrote a book, Save Our Strays, and this was quite a few years ago. At that time, about 5% of the veterinarians are doing prepubital spay-neuter work. Currently, it's probably closer to 10 to 12%, so it is going up, and it probably is going to plateau. I don't ever see it being much more than 20%, but it's irrelevant in that the people who are doing it are doing large scale. They're really good at what they're doing, and I personally consider it 
you know, one of the, the best kept secrets in veterinary medicine. As, as a veterinarian, you start doing it, anesthesia time's less, there's so many positive things. And you know, they don't die. It, it's just amazing, pre animals don't die under anesthesia from being spayed. They call it the bud of the spay. You can actually take anything under three months of age and go and just tear everything out, just tear and cut, and never suture anything, and they will not die. You know, it's it's pretty phenomenal, and it's real. It's you know, it's well written up in the literature. That's how people used to do it. Um, I remember being at a humane society once, and they had a whole bunch of really sick kittens, and I th I tried to talk them into euthanasia, and they wouldn't do it. And I thought, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and spay them. You know, their eyes were goob shut. They, you know, they probably had distemper. I don't know. You know, they were really really sick. But they didn't want me to leave without fixing them, and they didn't want me to euthanize them. So I spayed them all. And I give them a little bit more anesthetic than I probably should have, thinking maybe they'll just go to sleep and die. I come in the next day, and they're all up in their cage running around eating, you know? And it's like, okay, you really can't kill them. You know, it's pretty amazing to me. So um, prepubital spay and neuter has been done. There's, there's actually things that go back to 300 B.C. where they talk about fixing um, dogs. Uh, so it's been around for a long time. Medford, Oregon, the birthplace of prepubital spay and neuter, I would say, is Medford, Oregon. And once again, it's not the small animal vets. We tend to be a little more anal retentive and a little more like we think we're doctors instead of being veterinarians. Uh, where large animal vets tend to be more like veterinarians and not doctors. So they're more common sense. It's the herd health approach. And the gentleman who was doing their spay neuter work back in the 70s what came over from the, from the large animal side. And what he found is that they would adopt animals out They'd go out and have a litter, and he'd get the litter back from the animals they adopted out last year. The next year, he has another litter from those same animals. And he's like, this is crazy. Why don't we just spay and neuter everything? I do it in pigs. You know, we used to do it in pigs. We used to do it in sheep, you know, at a much younger age. So why don't we just do it to all the animals? And the board of directors said, good idea. Let's do this. It wasn't controversial. Nobody knew anything about prepubital spay and neuter, and he just did it. And what they found is the euthanasia rate and the return rate just dropped just went down dramatically. And, and Medford, Oregon is a small town, so it's probably a little easier to do in smaller situations. But he, you know, that person, that place is definitely given, you know, the, the, uh, the name of being the birthplace of prepubital spay and neuter. Uh, Leo Lieberman would be the father of prepubital spay and neuter. He wrote a, an article in 87, incredibly controversial, I mean, you can't believe the, the, the letters that went out over, you know, this is, this is horrible, this is horrible. Now, at the same time, we, we vasectomize babies at what age, you know? I mean, not vasectomize, I'm sorry, uh, circumcised babies, you know? Without anesthesia, I might add, without anesthesia, we probably should, we probably should vasectomize them too, quite frankly. Um, the, point, the point being is he had made a very good case, and it's the same thing. He just saw a tremendous number of animals being euthanized for no other reason than being born. So how do you stop that? You spay and neuter them prior to maturity. Um, I graduated in 89. I met with Leo Lieberman in the summer of 89, and ever since then I've been gun-ho, gun-ho, spay and neuter, anything that has a heartbeat. <laughs> So, uh, you know, the first real study, double blind kind of study, seven weeks versus seven months came along in 91 at the University of Florida, and basically they came up with nothing negative at that time. Um, the biggest fallacy that you heard back in those days, if you fix them, it'll stunt their growth. The exact opposite is true. The hormones of puberty are involved in bone plate closure, so what happens is they actually grow a little bit taller. It's pretty insignificant, it's barely significant, and, you know, I don't lose a lot of sleep over that. Um, this is more U.S. stats, but adopting, how many have adopting contracts? They probably don't, you don't do that here. You seem more progressive than we are in the U.S., to be honest with you. I'm kind of impressed, but, uh, you know, where you, you sign an agreement to bring the animal back to get it fixed at some point. You don't do that? Okay, excellent. Yeah. So you guys do that? I'll guarantee you don't have 100%. It's not, yeah, so, you know, proves my point. In, in Pueblo, Colorado, they, the government decided to get involved in spay and neuter, thought it was a good idea. And so what they said, look, you bring your animal, if you get it from the shelter, from the pound, you bring your animal to any veterinarian that signs up, which was every vet in the county except for one, and you get it for free, and we pay the vet. 30% of people showed up the first year, 30%. So that means 70% in Denton. It's pretty phenomenal. Okay, in America we have about 80 million dogs, 96 million cats. Um, have anyone heard the 70% rule? You know the 70% rule? 
Okay, throw it out. And if you get a paper on it, throw it away. It's all BS. It doesn't work. And M Dr. Marvin Mackey spoke here a few years ago. He's a big proponent of it. He's a dear friend of mine, and we argue about this all the time. It doesn't matter if you spay and neuter 70% of the animals, you still have overpopulation. Okay, simply because sex is kind of like frat boys on Friday night with too much beer. They don't care. Okay? And I'm sorry, hormones are, these animals are driven by hormones, and they, they find a way. So, and, and if it was true, then we shouldn't have an overpopulation problem in America because right now about 87% of the cats are fixed and 76%, 75%, kind of depends on who you read, um, are already fixed. So if we're already over 70%, why do we still have an overpopulation problem? You could argue that we don't in one sense, that people just aren't adopting from the right place. But does it really matter to that animal what the purpose is if it's being put to sleep? Not, not really. So uh, euthanasia is still the number one cause of death of animals, dogs and cats in America, euthanasia. Okay, it's about, and it's any, you know, it, it depends once again who you read. It could be anywhere from 3% to 6 to 8% of the population in a given year, which is pretty dramatic if you think about it. Uh, just simply by spay and neutering, you double the life of a street dog. Now, we don't have street dogs in America. I don't know if you have them here. Probably not. Maybe you do in the Northwest Territories, but not probably around here. Uh, but no question in places like Mexico where I have a clinic, uh, Slovakia, they don't really have sleep street dogs. But in Mexico, there's a lot of street dogs. And just by fixing them and vaccinating them, you more than double their lifespan. And it can be a pretty decent life, in all honesty. Um, it can also be a pretty harsh life. Uh, I consider prepubital spay and neuter a tool, nothing more, nothing less. It's one of those things. You know, it, it's easy to do. Your vets will love it. Any humane organization should be doing it. And quite frankly, as a humane organization, I don't know how we can stand up and preach ethics and say, you have to fix your animal. This is in their best interest. It's in society's best interest, you know, and you need to do it. And oh, by the way, we're adopting out animals on contracts and we don't get 100% of them to come back. You know, I mean, there's no logic in that whatsoever. Although as a species, we're not always very logical. Um, you know, animals, dogs bond between eight, eight and 12 weeks, cats six and nine weeks. Those are real critical periods if you understand behavior and stuff. So it's really, in my, in my mind, important to get them fixed at that six week, seven, eight week period and then get them out into a home. And if you have to fix them, now, once again, it kind of depends on what age you can legally adopt them at. Uh, some places, cats are kind of irrelevant. They don't care. Dogs, in, a, in most places, it's usually eight weeks. Uh, some places, 10 weeks. The point being, if they're fixed before they go out, they can never reproduce. So that's a pretty major thing. The veterinary profession, uh, friends, foe. Um, 1993, the AVMA, that's the American Veterinary Medical Station. These are pretty conservative bunch of guys, okay? I mean, it was just the last couple of years they decided leg hold traps might, in fact, be a little bit cruel. You know, so it's not like they're the most progressive group in the world. You know, having said that, in 93, they decided prepubital spay and neuter is really not a bad thing and should help, be a very important tool in helping with overpopulation. Yet the general consensus of the veterinary profession is we don't want to do it. Why? Well, because in school you're taught you do them at six months or nine months or ten months or whatever it is. And the question is why? There is absolutely no science behind that. None. It is based on tradition. That's it. Okay? Ask your vet, why won't you do pre -pubital? Now, you know, in the last 20 years, there's all this literature going back and forth, and there's these studies done and all this, and most of them I can drive a Mack truck through the flaws in the studies. But the truth is this, that there is not core, there's a difference between correlation and causation. And the, the example I love to give is the sale of ice cream in New York City, if it goes up, the murder rate goes up, okay? And I can show you a scientific paper that makes that conclusion, okay? Now, in my, the logic part of me says then just ban the sale of ice cream and the murder rate should drop, right? Well, it happens to be the ice cream goes up because the ambient air temperature goes up, okay? This is not rocket science. But if you read the paper, the conclusion would be the sale of ice cream causes murder or maybe murder causes the sale of ice cream, depending on how you look at it. Um, the, as, as a profession, we are really bad about causation. As a society and as a species, we're really bad. Because quite frankly, one of my favorite stories is I neutered a gentleman's dog one time. It was three months old. We neutered it. I got a call five, four or five months later. He was threatening to kill me because I killed his dog. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what's going on? 
He goes, my dog never jumped the fence before it was neutered. It jumped the fence, got hit by a car, and died. And somehow that was my fault five months later. I said, and I said, just for a second, is it possible that your dog grew a little bit in that period of time? <laughs> or did you have a hole in your fence? You know? So that's what, you know, as a veterinarian, and, and if there's, I don't know if there's any vets in the crowd here, but you can certainly identify, and, and I guess people in general should be able to identify, you do something, anything that happens after that is because you did that something, you know, and, and it just isn't the case. I want to see double blind studies on things, and most of the, the studies we do are retroactive where we look back at populations. Uh, to say ACLs are more common in fixed dog, or uh, in spayed dogs than unspayed dogs. Why is that, okay? No one answers that. You know, they just say, well, it's two times the rate. Well, in America, if you believe that 76% of the dogs are fixed, okay, that means for every three fixed dogs, there's one unfixed dog. So if the torn ACLs are equal, then there should be three torn ACLs for every one ACL torn ligament in an unfixed dog. There should be a three to one ratio. There's only a two to one ratio. Now, am I gonna make the conclusion that that means by fixing them, you save a leg sometimes? No, I don't make that conclusion. But the point is you have to look at your population base, and the population base is different. The ones that go to referral, I would make the argument that intact animals that are on chains and backyards, and we all know these people, we all know those situations, how they're kept, okay, do you think they go to a veterinarian, you know? But your animal that lives with you as part of your family that you hike and run with and, and does something, it's gonna go to a veterinarian. So the, the, you already have a skew in the population immediately just because of that. And we don't take those kind of epidemiological things into account. We just look at raw numbers. And raw numbers are very misleading. The good news is that many vet schools are teaching free people to spay and neuter. And they don't really come down one way hard, one way on you know, either side. They just say we need more research, we need to look at this more. Now we've been looking at it for 20 some years. And does anyone have any one specific thing they can name that's an issue with prepubital spay neuter that you hear from your vets? Anybody? Incontinence, absolutely. And that's the one I'll give you. And it's about a two to one, it's about a two to one ratio. Having said that, there is literature that indicates if you do prepubes really young, they're less likely, but it also has to do with the fat content. I contend that it has to do with hypothyroidism, allergy issues, and there's literature that backs me in all this. Uh, you look at breed-specific things, they're very breed, hypothyroidism, so certain breeds, you don't see it in small dogs very often, you don't see it in male dogs, you see it in the bigger breed females that are overweight. Females that are fixed are two times more likely to be overweight than unfixed. Why is that? I can make the argument because they live with us and we tend to overeat, so we tend to feed our animals too much. Um, I would also make the argument that they don't have to be. I have all fixed dogs and them are overweight. So you don't have to be that one-third of the population that overeats, okay? You can be that one-third of the population that exercises their dog, keeps it at the proper weight, and guess what? It doesn't have urinary incontinence near as much. So there's multiple factors involved, and I contend that many times it has to do with surgical technique, that if you're using cat gut at the base of the uterus, you are not doing the right thing by the animal. Do I have a double-blind scientific study on that? No but it's been my gut impression. I've gone in too many times on animals and taken out big granulomas because where the, when you t cut and tie the uterus, it retracts back and it's right at the trigone of the bladder where all continent issues start, okay? So the type of suture becomes very important. In uh, Costa Rica, they're having a big issue with spay and neuter and pre stuff because they're using these big bands, you know, like bands you put around a radiator hose. They're big nylon bands. And they're as wide as my finger, you know? You don't think that's not a problem sitting right, rubbing right there next to the base of the bladder? You know, I wouldn't do that to any animal, you know, but yet it's fast, it's cheap, so therefore they do it. And then when they have all these problems later, they can't figure out why, you know. So if you're going to do a job, do it right. And I think there's, a, once again, I think I will give incontinence is probably maybe you double it. So a, a female that has multiple litters has a four to eight percent chance of, of having incontinence and there's other factors that involve as they gain weight, they're more likely to have incontinence even if they're not fixed. But it's probably eight to 16% will get incontinence if they are fixed. Now the question is, can we take some of that eight and 16% and drop it down by changing our technique, by making sure they're not overweight, by dealing with their underlying hypothyroidism? Uh, certain breeds like Dobermans, guess what? They're gonna have urinary incontinence. <laughs> Boxers are gonna have urinary incontinence because they're always hypothyroid and they're almost always overweight or have other issues, you know? So there's lots of issues involved. Um, 
I can put my glasses on so I can actually see the problem getting old. Um, you know, I'm once again being kind of a half empty kind of guy. I, I always wonder, like, are we making a difference? And this is what I'll tell you, and I, and I think Richard brought that up. In the 70s and 80s, we were killing 24 million animals a year in America. 24 million. I think that's like 60,000 a day. And now they're saying 3 million. I don't believe the 24 million. I didn't believe the 3 million. I think it was probably close to 30 million, and my guess is we're probably close to 6 million right now. But even if, even if you take the, the numbers that they have, 24 to 3, or if you take my numbers, 30 to 6, that's over a 20-some year period. That's a hell of a drop. You know, that's just tremendous. You know, and, I mean, it's, it's doable is the point. It makes, the, like, the goal in, you know, in sight. You know it's there. There's a possibility of actually achieving something. It has to do with education. We all talk about education, but we do very little of it. As a veterinary profession, we're really bad about educating people. Someone brings in their mixed breed mutt, and he's really cool. i got to breed him because I want one just like him. What does that mean? You know, or she has to have a litter to settle her. I'm thinking, of God, well, I guess my, I better have a child with my wife because she's not very settled, <laughs> and, you know. And, and at 40, I don't know. It may be too late, so... This is just a list of the groups, you know, that are kind of for prepubital spay and neuter, and they're pretty substantial, you know. Um, and there's some there's some big names there: Colorado State, Florida State. I mean, these are not these are you know, uh, Cornell University. You know, these are not slouchy universities. Some of the best in the in the in the world, you know. So, how can as a profession I can say, well, I don't believe in it, you know, I and mean, it has to be bad. Well, if everyone else believes in it, why don't you believe in it, you know? It simply goes back to tradition, you know? It's something they fear. You know, the montage of the veterinary profession is we fear change, and we really do, because you always are afraid of something different. Change an anesthetic protocol. Try to get someone to change their anesthetic protocol. They will go crazy, because they are so afraid of killing something or doing something wrong. So, and there's probably a good reason for being a little conservative and being a little fear, afraid of change, but at the same time, it can't stifle you when you're looking at the, the massive overpopulation, the massive destruction of what we consider companion animals. I, it's never made any sense to me. And once again, I may not be a real bright guy, but you know, how can you take an animal in with a broken leg to a nice hospital and they go, well, it's $3,000 to fix his broken leg. And the people are sitting there, you know, they have three kids and they're just barely making it and our economy's not good right now. And they go, well, I don't have $3,000. Well, we'll put it to sleep and kill it for you for $100. Now, you know, where's the intrinsic value of the animal? What are you, what as a profession are you telling that person? You know, if you have $3,000, I will fix your dog and I'm worth every penny of that. But if you don't have $3,000, I'll kill it for a hundred. I, I don't understand that, you know, and there's nothing in between. How is that possible? It makes no sense to me. You know, I, I can do the same $3,000 surgery for $300 and I can make money on it. How is that possible for me to be able to do that and them not being able to do that? They don't want to lower their standard. Well, what does that mean? I, I, you know, that's never been clear to me either. Lowering the standard, saving a life is what you're doing. And you have to look at the big picture. You have a family there. You have three kids that care about the animal. The animal, you know, let's say it jumped out of the car. Something happened, who knows? But the point is, they didn't intend that tragedy to happen when it did, and they don't have the money. So the best we can do as a modern society and as a profession is say, we'll kill it for you. I, I find that a just revolting, quite frankly, which is probably why vets don't like me too much. Um, this is, you know, this is why humane societies don't always like me either. Uh, warehousing. Companion animals will never solve overpopulation. You have 100 cages, you'll have 120 animals in them. That does not solve anything, okay? Does it make a difference to some of those individual animals? I'd almost make the argument it's probably worse for them, not better for them, but that's beside the point. You know, you must have an educational campaign. You must be doing spay and neuter. You must have a feral cat campaign. There's no question. You know, the cats have about 2.1 litters a year, 4.5 kittens per litter. They just, it's perpetual, you know. And the bottom line is 80 percent, the, there's some estimates as high as 80 percent of the kittens, the new kittens in America that go into shelters or go into people's houses come from the feral or the stray populations, not from the young ones, because we know about 80-some percent, almost 90 percent are already fixed. And I think it's probably the same here, about 90 percent are fixed of cats, you know, that are owned, identified as owned. Okay, so it always gets to be, you know, the person that comes in and says, well, this cat has an abscess. Um, it's not really my cat. I've only been feeding it for the last three years. When does it become your cat? I don't know, you know. So there's no question as a profession, 
and as a group, we've done a really poor job of educating people about cats. We're kind of on board with dogs. We understand them as family members. 65, 80% of the people consider their dog part of their family, okay? We don't consider cats quite the same way. Probably because dogs have been domesticated for 80 to 100,000 years. They're the first animal ever domesticated by mankind, okay? So we have a primordial connection with them. Cats, okay, more like 6,000 to 10,000 years. So we're not quite there yet. So maybe in another 100,000 years, we'll look at them differently. Who knows? But I think these are, these are basic things I really believe you need to do. Um, I don't have up there Peter Curley's name, but the uh, Rex Foundation, Peter Curley, Budapest, Hungary, they, had, they got a huge grant and they had a choice. They could build a bunch more cages and they had like a space for about 100 animals. And he said, no, that doesn't make sense. Let's instead build a spay-neuter facility and do more spay-neuter and offer it for a low cost and let's have hire a trainer, a dog trainer that comes out three days a week and let's hire an animal behaviorist that comes out three days a week and works with the animals. That, you know, so when someone brings an animal, why are you bringing me this animal? He's peeing all over my house. Okay, it's a little dog that's marking because he's not neutered. You know, just by neutering him, you can drop the problems by something like 70%, you know, on cats about 90%. So that's where we come in, that's where you come in, and that's the future, okay? As you get down to zero, you're still gonna have problems. You're still gonna have people bringing in animals for some ridiculous reason. The question is, can we rehome those back in the same home because we've corrected the problem? And that's where behavior and, you know, behavior modification and training and things like that and education come in. I think they're really important. Um, this kind of goes into the medical stuff, and I can spend three hours just on this slide, but the bottom line is urinary incontinence, I'll give you that one. It's about twice as much, okay? But once again, the argument's not valid when you consider the difference between life and death, you know? It just doesn't make sense, you know? And, and veterinarians are always saying, well, you know, if you spay everything, then we won't have any animals, we won't make any money. They'll say, well, if I spay everything, you'll have incontinence, so you can sell them drugs, you know? I mean, <laughs> so, you know, it's all, it's all a matter of perspective and how you look at it, you know? So, um, and it, it does go back to correlation versus causation. You know, um, vegetarians live seven years on average longer. Why is that? Not because they're vegetarians per se, but because vegetarians tend to have a certain lifestyle, a healthier lifestyle overall. It's not just because they're vegetarians, okay? Does it help? Sure. They're probably not going to have a heart attack, you know, but they're just as prone to have certain kinds of cancers. So, you know, you, people use uh, hemangiosarcomas, more common in fixed female um, or fixed male uh, golden retrievers and females than unfixed. Okay, once again, where's the population base you're coming from? And it represents point, less than 0.2% of the total cancers uh, in those dogs. So how much of a factor is that when you're looking at thousands, millions of animals being killed? You know, it's just not a valid factor. Uh, I'm for, I like purebred dogs. I don't have a problem with legitimate good breeders breeding legitimate good dogs. But how many veterinarians actually will say to you when you bring in, oh, the classic would be, uh, I'm trying to think here, I had, a, I had someone bring in a Pomeranian once and they bought it at a pet store and it cost six or eight hundred dollars and they were thinking about breeding it. It was three months old and it weighed 30 pounds. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Pomeranians, but they're really not supposed to be 30 pounds at three months old. And I'm looking at dog and I think, well, I think there was a chow in there somewhere, you know, I don't know, you know, it's like, that's not a pom, you know, but this person had a paper that said it was a Pomeranian and by God, they wanted to breed it, you know? And that's the kind of thing, how many vets are gonna interact with them? Now their choice with me is, the, okay, okay, you either fix it or there's the door. Don't let it hit you on the ass on the way out. Cause I, you know, I have a full service veterinary hospital. We do everything, but nothing leaves our front door without being fixed. And we're probably the only for-profit in America that's that way. And we've been that way ever since I started. And I have, just for the record, 50,000 clients in my registry, which is a pretty big hospital by any standard. Here are the, you know, this is, if you get into prepubital, and certainly if any of the vets were here, I would love to talk to you about this. Hypoglycemia, hypothermia, and hypotension are the big ones you worry about. You know, cats and dogs have a higher respiration rate, higher O2 consumption, higher heart rate. Having said all that, they do not die. You really got to work at killing a prepub animal. I mean, it, you know, you got to concentrate on it. So um, I like doing certain things. I like, I, like de I mean, in an ideal world, I, I would deworm them. I'd do all these things prior to it. Well, that's not always an ideal world. When I go to reservations, I'm there for two or three days at a time, 
it, once again, if they have a heartbeat, we do them, you know. Would I prefer them to be vaccinated ahead of time? Absolutely. Would I prefer them to be dewormed? Absolutely. But guess what? None of the animals are vaccinated or dewormed on the reservations, and they're not going to be, you know. So at least I can stop them from being reproducing more and more. Uh, there are certain things you need to do if you can in your situation, and obviously in the places you can, I mean, and, and they do. So um, I like keeping them heated service. I think the biggest single problem you have is hypothermia. Uh, we, you know, for years we thought hypoglycemia was a big thing with small animals. We know it's not, and I've done my own studies where I pull out blood and check their glucose. It doesn't seem to change a whole lot. We used to give dextrose. We still do. It doesn't hurt them, but at this point I'm not convinced it helps them any either. Uh, I think they're, they're pretty good at balancing. Having said that, if you get something really sick and emaciated, you probably want to treat it a little bit more prior to surgery. Uh, major advantages. Extremely low complication rate. Extremely low death rate. Uh, rapid recovery, it's phenomenal. And if you just, if you could just see them, I don't have, has anyone ever seen pre-pubes wake up, you know, that are five or six weeks? Within an hour, they're, they're playing, they're eating. They're, I mean, it's like nothing ever happened to them. You know, and then you have the nine-year-old bitch that you just did that doesn't wake up for three days, and when she does, she's walking all stiff and sore, you know, and you're spending all this extra money on, on all these drugs for pain control and everything else, you know, and it's like, and you're much more likely to have a complication. So it, it really is the best kept secret in veterinary medicine. I don't know why every vet's not doing it, quite frankly, because it's, it's, it's such an easy thing to do. And the biggest single thing, it ensures that animal will never reproduce, which is really our goal. And I got a few pictures here, and that's Dr. Marvin Mackey, who is definitely a legend in his own time. And, you know, anything comes in, we do them. Um, I have no problem wheeling dealing. Someone says, I found, I have these kittens. I well, the first thing I say is, where's the mom? I won't take, you know, I don't mind taking kittens and, and rehoming them, but I want to know where the mom is because, you know, I, I can stop that cycle, but if mom's still out there, well, she's kind of semi-feral. Here's a trap. Bring me mom. I'll take care of the kittens for you. You know, you got to wheel and deal all the time. That's a, I believe that was a three-week-old kitten there. So not very big. And then, maybe, you know, so, yeah. yeah. Pe people never like those pictures, but, you know. It really isn't torture, and, you know, that kitten literally two hours later was running around playing, okay? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to believe, but, uh, you know, so I don't know. You know, they can't read and write, but it sure can multiply. Please neuter your pets. We're friends and relatives. Man, if you knew my relatives, you'd, you'd know why I put that one on there. So, you know, it's uh, this is how you get a hold of me. SpayNeuterTaskForce.org is, we call it the task force technique. I'll be talking about, about that a little bit later today. Um, it's an incredible resource, and they have lots of pictures and things, and their CDs, you can get from them. I do have a copy of their CDs, and I, I'm more than happy to burn them because I don't really care about copyright laws, and they're friends of mine anyway. So uh, PlannedPetedPlus.com is how you can get a hold of me. We do have a new website. I am totally computer illiterate, but we are putting more and more stuff on there. Um, and I do have an article on prepubital spay-neuter that has lots of resources in terms of uh, scientific literature. So, and I have a few with me I can hand out too, but there, there's really no reason for your vets not to be doing this. So, and I think that's it. Okay, we've got about five minutes for questions. Would anybody like to ask a question? Do we have um, some microphone? No questions? Yes, we have some questions here. Just hold on. Just get a microphone to you, sorry, just so everybody can hear. Yeah. Hi, I'm Anne Enright. I'm from the Cat Haven in Western Australia and one of the, the vets and I was just wanting to know what drugs you were using uh, to... <laughs> 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 Whatever. <laughs> Whatever you want to disclose, I don't mind. <laughs> Uh, could we? Oh, it's not there on. You are. Hello. It's right now. It, it depends on where I go, because uh, I go all over the world to do stuff. And and what I found is I know groups that like fly in and stuff, and like I mean they even fly in anesthesia machines. And my thing is, okay, I want to do things that are sustainable. So I quit. The first thing I say is like, what do you have available to you? And then I'll come up with a protocol that you can use. I'm going to be putting multiple pro protocols on our website real soon. But I like uh, Telazol. You know, which is, you know, so I like Tilazol mixed with some ACE, and you can add Medican. You can do different things. But uh, 
Um, you know, the big movement in America now is certainly all about pain management. Uh, I'm involved in testifying on several different lawsuits involving Remedel and different other things. So bottom line is all drugs have side effects. Be aware of that. And pain, while well, there's no question animals perceive it the exact same way we do, they deal with it a lot better than we do. And uh, I think, you, you know, you've got to use certain things judiciously. You know, if you're going to drive up the price of a spay and neuter by adding Dormitor or something like that to the, to the protocol, that's fine. But who's paying for it? You know, and that's what it gets down to. I think Telazol um, works really good. Uh, TKX, Telazol with ketamine and rompin. Uh, Peggy Larson has the five-minute cat spay, and I have that video, too, where she spays a cat in five minutes, and um, she's done 40,000, 50,000 of them. And she used TKX, and she swears she never has a death, you know. I don't know if that's true or not, but she swears by that, so. Any other questions? Yes? Hi, Rachel from the Maribyrnong Animal Refuge. I'm just wondering, from your own point of view, um, how we can, uh, you mentioned that it's uh, very difficult to change opinions of, and in our area we find that they're very hesitant to do anything younger than six to eight months. How's the best way to approach them to get them to look at early age desexing and making it part of an everyday protocol? Well, I, the truth is, that's, once again, glass half empty. You got to go around them. You, you know, the ones that are out there, they've been out there for a while, probably aren't going to change in all honesty. But what I'll tell you is this, and I hate to say, once I've said this several times since I've been here, I hate to say this about my sex, but the reality of it is there's more and more females in our profession. And the medical profession in America is driven by females. And quite frankly, you guys just happen to be a little bit more compassionate than us guys. So those changes are happening automatically in America. The, the women coming out are much more open-minded, much more willing. They see shelter medicine, they see overpopulation as an issue, a societal issue, and they want to get involved. And I'll tell you just the good news, I lecture at universities all over the world, and I was in India recently, I was in Mexico recently, and I was kind of shocked at the number of kids that said, we really want to get back to the community. We want to do more. Our professors don't, won't, won't let us. You know, they don't have the money for it. So I, I think with globalization, I, and I'm not a real fan of globalization, but, and I hate the animal planet, but having said that, that darn show, the animal planet, has probably driven more compassion around the world than anything else. It's crazy because if people watch that and they're like, we want to be like them. You know, we want to do that. And, you know, we want to help. And we want to, now they don't understand what it costs to do that. But who am I to squash their dreams, right? <laughs> Other questions? And I guess in answer to your question, I mean, that's what um, University of Queensland, Jackie, isn't it, is working on at the moment and trying to get vets out there who are aware. But it is a difficult problem in a regional area where you have no vets who will do it. Responsibilities, and they come out with the stories, and they're really, you know, like they, they feel comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, we've done studies where we actually lectured the students and gave them a video on early age desex, and then we followed them up nine months later in practice, and they still weren't doing it, and it was because they felt uncomfortable, and then they took a job with a practice where the boss didn't do it. They have to come out hands-on skills, really comfortable, this is how we do it, let me show you. And, you know, we've got the, f we, our students this year are not going to graduate with real hands, hands-on skills. That's our goal next year, to take it to the next level. But they're certainly committed and they're seeing it done and a few have had hands-on skills. But I think it's training that crop and getting Thank them you. to go out and preaching the message and changing practice in the practices. And for the record, you send me a veterinary student, you send me a veterinarian to Denver, I'll put them up for free and I'll train them. No, you know, it doesn't cost anything. So you just got to get them there. So it costs to fly them there, but you get them there and they can stay for two weeks, two months. I've had one person stay for a year. I don't care. Bottom line is they'll be well trained when they come back. Okay. Oh, we've got another question. Uh, Peter? Yeah, just one comment that, the, you know, old dogs can learn new tricks and the one thing you do need to do is get one vet in your community doing it. Yeah. And that's what we did. You know, Whangarei is an example. They employed a vet to do the early age desexing when they started moved to desexing. And probably within a year, all the clinics were doing it. 
simply because they started losing money because the vets started doing it on their own animals and their own clients and it changed within a year. So you just need one. And we had that person down, we trained them in our clinic and the, the shelters will do it and hopefully all the shelters will do it. Um, all you need to do is just get one trained in the community. So, no more questions? Well, thank you very much, Jeff. That was fantastic. Thank you.